Radio Raheem here with Matthew Macklin. You know, usually I interview you before your own fight or after your own fight, but it's been about a year now since yeah. that thing has been, uh, you've hung up those gloves, uh, and now you've transitioned quite smoothly in the management of other fighters. First of all, just talk to me about what that transition's like, knowing that, you know, your, your fights, your career in the ring is done, and how has it been to now deal with other fighters who, you know, you've seen what they've gone through, and now you're trying to guide them in their careers? Yeah, well, um, I suppose my own career, uh, retiring, it was kind of um, it was kind of a drawn-out thing in the, in the sense that I actually retired on a four-fight winning streak. So, so the last before... That streak started, uh, which would have been September, I think November 2014, and I retired um, of April 2000, uh, May 2016. It was almost like a, a winding down period, really, because I think in my in my heart and soul, I'd retired after that loss. I was gonna retire, and I thought, no, I'll give it another go, come back with a few wins, but then failing to really recapture the kind of love or the or the kind of level, the, you know, the performances. Uh, I just I had a good think after. I thought, nah, that'll do me. So. You know, I retired, and I'd, we'd been, I'd been involved in managing some fighters uh, with my partner in uh, MTK Global, and then we, um, I got a lot more involved with it once I retired. I had more time, had more sort of enthusiasm for it, and uh, I feel my, my career was, you know, a 15-year career. I was with many different promoters, uh, several trainers, and uh, so I think, you know, I really uh, understand the sport of boxing from many viewpoints, you know, from different, you know, you get a, you get a good trainer that has one, he's very, probably good at training a certain type of fighter. Then you get another good trainer who's completely different, but he's still a good trainer. And I, I was with different guys, so I've seen, you know, I've seen boxing from different perspectives. And I was, like I said, I was with different promoters, I was diff different man managers, and I was always very kind of almost control freakish a little bit in my own career. I wanted to know everything that was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I was, I was, I'd read up on everything. I, I was very in touch with who was getting what, what fights were getting made, who was with who. I was kind of very sort of had me ears to the floor. I was wanting to know kind what every own mini manager. Big time, big time I was. And uh, so I think, you know, I think it was inevitable that I was probably going to go in. At, the, at one time, if you'd have asked me, I said, no way, once I retire, that's it, I'm done, I'm sick of the sport. <laughs> but, you know, I. I'm glad I stayed in and because uh, I do love the game and I'm actually I feel like I'm getting the love back more mm -hmm. now in a different capacity. Well, I will say this: I've interviewed a lot of fighters, obviously at different stages in their career, and for a guy who's retired with a new career, you're actually your face lit up when you started talking about you know the details of the fights and who's doing what and what's getting made. So obviously, this is something that is got is in your heart and you really have passion for it. You got Michael Conlon here, who I've seen passion in your eyes about him as well. Why is this guy as special as you describe? You say that he may be like you know the next like superstar in the sport. He's got McGregor carrying the flag. That's you know, that's no small thing. What makes this guy special? Well, you know you need two things, don't you, to become a star. You, you obviously have to have the personality and the charisma, and you know whether whether you're a you know Mike Tyson who surly doesn't speak but just comes out and knocks guys clean out, or you know you're a a Prince Nassim Hamed or a Conor McGregor who's trash talking, flamboyant. You know, it's uh, you need something that stands out, and uh, you know, M Michael has lots of charisma, very personable, loads of personality. But you also have to have the ability. You know, you can you can have all the personality and charisma in the world, but if you can't fight, you're not going to you're not going to become a superstar. But he can really fight. Mm. You know, he's probably Ireland's best ever amateur boxer. He's certainly the most decorated, achieved the most, and uh, you know. Like I said, and in, in in the press conference, you know, Mexican fans have always been known for how they support and how passionate they are. Hence, Cinco de Mayo and the Mexican weekend are the big sort of weekends for pay per view events because they do the big numbers. But I I feel that uh, Irish boxing fans have always been a sleeping giant. You know, always been asleep. You had guys like John Duddy, Andy Lee, myself that were good fighters. You know, and uh, you know we, we we got great support and the atmosphere was electric. But I think Michael. He's going to kind of be a great, great fighter, and not just a great fighter. He's with the right people. He's with top rank from the from the get go, from the start. So he's going to be built like a star. Like I say, he's headlining here at Madison Square Garden on St Patrick's Day. It's his pro debut. You yeah. know that doesn't happen. <laughs> right. You know, so he has he has everything in place to become a superstar. All he just got to keep winning. You know, he's just got to dedicate himself. He's got to live the life. You know, it's all it's great us hyping him up and talking about it, and and it's true. Like I'm not, it's not, it's not put on. I believe all these things I say about him, but he still has to go and do it. You know, and boxing's a two-horse race. There's a, there's a guy across in the other corner that he's reading a different script. 
you know, he's reading a different script. So you have to, Mick has to stay focused, has to prepare hard, train hard, live the life, make weight properly. There's, there's a million ways it can go wrong. And, you know, he has to, he's got everything in place for it to go right, but he has to apply himself and uh, stay humble, stay grounded and really live the life. Well, I might just unroll my sleeping bag on Friday night and stick around because a guy who's made himself a superstar, who you know well, Triple G is going to be coming right in behind him in the garden. And you uh, you offered your thoughts to Kell Brook before he faced Triple G. And some people think that Kell Brook, you know, uh, showed some flaws in Triple G's game, maybe some cracks in that uh, seemingly impenetrable armor. So now that Jacobs comes behind him, a guy with maybe a heavier punch, what kind of chance do you give him? What kind of advice would you give him? Uh, yeah, I mean, I thought Cal, Cal boxed unbelievably well against Golovkin. I think for someone, a welterweight, to step up and fight the most fearsome middleweight in the world, I thought that was just commendable in itself. I thought he... Uh He's very skilled fighter, Cal Brook, great movement, unorthodox, and he landed some really good shots. You know, having said that, you know, when you're not really scared of the power coming at you, you tend to get hit more. You know, you do, you're not as defensively, you're not sharp. I don't think he had respect for Cal's power. You know, I think Cal might have buzzed him with his speed, but I don't think he had the heavy, the, you know, the... What? He didn't have a heavy enough hands to really shake him up. Golovkin's got a good chin. We've seen him get hit by Curtis Stevens and walked right through it. So I don't think he had the respect that... Uh, to me, Golovkin looked like a guy that was prepared to take six or seven punches just to land one. He thought, mm. that this welterweight's not going to last. As soon as I catch him, it's over. Buzzed him in the first round. And I think after that, he went knockout happy. And it probably took him until the fourth, fifth round to just kind of settle down a bit. and land, You know what I mean? And start landing, right. putting shots together. I don't think that'll be the case with Danny Jacobs. I think he knows Danny Jacobs has real good speed. He has good power. He's a big middleweight. He caught Peter Quillen quickly in the first round. So, you know, you know, and Quillen's a good fighter. So I think I think Golovkin will know that Danny is dangerous. And I think I think because he knows he's dangerous, he'll be sharp. You know, as soon as the fight starts, he'll be focused and he'll be sharp. And, uh, you know, it could go early. Wouldn't, wouldn't shock me at all. <laughs> Radio Raheem with Matthew Macklin. It's always been a pleasure to watch you fight. Your managerial skills are showing their uh, prominence right now at Madison Square Garden at the theater Friday night. Your client, <laughs> Michael Conlon, is going to step into the arena for his pro debut. Good luck tomorrow on our Friday night. Radio Raheem with Matthew Macklin.